I would like to welcome our first speaker, Dave Holmes. Um, Dave uh, joined Macmillan in, as a teacher trainer in 2005. He then moved to the Macmillan Training Services team, where he co-designed a very successful project called Macmillan Early Learning Project or PATH. And this project actually reached the finals of the British Council Elton's Award. And then he moved to the By Me team or department. Now, By Me is a partnership between Macmillan and, and, and Edel Vives uh, to publish for the bilingual sector, both at primary and secondary level. And in the By Me team, uh, Dave um, edited the Social Science 3 book for primary. He also co or he also authored the Formation Professionnelle uh, level English levels one and two books. And since the autumn of 2019, Dave has been with us in the educational uh, consultants department, and we're delighted to have him and to have all his experience and contributions to the team. Uh, today, Dave's talk is called One Activity, Many Faces. Welcome, Dave. Hi, Louise. Thanks for that welcome. How are you doing? You're looking well. Good. You're looking really well as well. It looks oh, like you've had good. the sun. That's good. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that, despite my weeks of confinement. Um, yes. I'm feeling well. I hope everybody else is well. Is everybody well? You're looking well. Well, I'm sure you would if I could see you. Um, as Louise says, welcome to this session, which is called One Activity, Many Faces. And uh, why many faces for one activity? Well, because we need to make each activity accessible to all our learners. OK, uh, so the sort of common denominator here is or the, the under, underlying message is mixed ability. And uh, I'm going to launch straight in with a question. OK. Uh, that I'd like you to answer um, using the, uh, how, the the poll, okay? Um, you'll see a series of uh, statements here, uh, typical myths about mixed ability teaching, okay? One of them, I think, is actually true, okay? One truth amid the myths, okay? So, uh, can you go to the uh, poll tool, okay? And I will read them all out. And uh, whichever one you think is correct, just type the letter A, B, C or D. OK, first one, um, catering for different levels means a lot more preparation. If you think that's true, choose A, write A, OK? Uh, if you think B is correct, pupils either complete a task or they don't, choose B. That means there's nothing in between. It's either right or wrong. OK, you complete the task or you don't. Or C, it is important to establish a baseline for each activity and then decide how you can build on this. If you think that's correct, choose C. And finally, in any group or pair work activity, pupils need to work with other pupils of similar ability. If not, the less able ones will hold the more able ones back. So what do you think? A, B, C or D? Go to the live polls and choose your answer. Well, Dave, the answers are coming in. Are they coming already? That's good. Yes, yes, yes. No, as you were speaking, they were coming in very quickly. Um, so thank you to everybody. It seems right. like there's a majority, a majority who think, a majority of about 78, 70, well, 80 percent who think that C it is important to establish a baseline for each activity and then decide how you can build on this. Followed by 20% who think that A is correct and then D, 4%, no, actually B, 6%. B is pupils either complete a task or they don't. And finally, 4% say D. OK, well, I personally would agree with the ones who said C. 
Okay, and that's what I hope to demonstrate. Okay, it's true the ones that said A, yep, sometimes that can happen, but it doesn't always have to happen. Okay, um, before I go on, I'd just like to say we're talking about mixed ability. Okay, but um, different levels, di when we're talking about different levels, okay, mixed ability isn't the only thing that we, um, that we find in our classes. Um, we also find mixed levels of motivation. We find uh, mixed levels of confidence, mixed circumstances, and also mixed abilities in plural rather than mixed ability is really how good they are at English. Okay, different levels, the stronger ones, the weaker ones, the ones in between. We tend to just focus on how good they are at English, whereas mixed abilities, okay, is a slightly more positive way of looking at it, okay, uh, how good they are at other things as well as English. And that's really important to take into consideration. For example, um, some of them might be good at drawing, they might be artistic. Uh, some of them might uh, be quite musical, they may be good dancers, have a good sense of rhythm, okay. Uh, some of them might be good at memorising, they might not be quite so good at analysing, but they might be good at memorising. Others may have mental or physical agility and be really quick off the mark. Uh, and so it's important to take um, all of these things into account, as we'll try to do. OK, when we're approaching an activity, I think the, the, the best way to look at it is to remember this three Ds. I've always found it helpful. The three Ds being diagnose, decode and diversify. OK, what I mean by this is diagnose is think to yourself, what challenges will my pupils face with this activity? How many are going to be able to do it as it stands, okay, without changing it, as it stands, as it is presented in the course book? Will I need to simplify it? Or will I need to not necessarily simplify it, but support their learning, scaffold it? Or will I need to extend it? Okay. And what about the language itself? How will I decode it? What, may they, what might my, my pupils find difficult about the language? And then diversify. What can I do to bring in the other strengths that my pupils might have? OK. So talking about scaffolding, which is one of the big things that we, uh, we can do to help. OK. It's always good to bear in mind another group of three, the three R's. Recycling, realia and regular routines. Okay, let me show you what I mean. We'll start off with regular routines. Okay, so um, they may not have two, they, at the moment I'm gonna look at first, uh, the first two years of primary, first and second, but really these things are adaptable to, to other levels as well. But um, thinking specifically about early primary when we have routines, OK, or, or we um, particularly signal our routines, what we can do is take some of the language away from the course book, some of the language they may have more difficulty with. They may be OK at word level, but at sentence level, they may need a little bit more support. So we can take some of our sentence level language and form routines from it. Typical question, answer, stimulus, response routines. Can I have some bananas, please? Here you are. The teacher asks the question, the pupils answer the question. We can build this into a transitional routine. And what we're doing is we're giving pupils that extra exposure and practice of production of the new language. So it's a good way of scaffolding, okay? Then we can change it from bananas to apples, okay, to bring in uh, the other vocabulary. One way we can uh, help pupils to, uh, to, to become familiarised with the rhythm and the intonation of the new language chunks is to do a back chaining uh, uh, activity. I don't know that you're familiar with this, but um, English is a stress timed language, which basically means that the stress falls at regular intervals. The stress falls at regular intervals, okay? When I say that sentence, I'm heading for the word intervals. I know where I'm going. That's the last word. So with back chaining, we take the last word and we build backwards, okay? I'll give you a quick demonstration. In a class, I would do this uh, 
uh, a lot more slowly, but I'll just show you how it works. Bananas, please. Some bananas, please. Have some bananas, please. Can I have some bananas, please, etc. So you're working back, working on rhythm and intonation. And this is particularly good for pupils who are quite musical and have a good sense of rhythm. It really helps them. OK, realia, realia. I've never known how to pronounce it, but what it means is bringing real objects into the classroom. And very often the kinds of uh, lexical sets uh, word groups, vocabulary sets that we find in early primary books are quite easy to get hold of. It might be food. We can bring it in easily. Classroom objects, toys. So why don't we set up situations where we can get them to act out? Can I have some bananas, please? Whatever the dialogue, but pr provide them with a chance to use that language in a meaningful context. Recycling. OK, here's an activity called conveyor belt. Very easy. Two boxes, one here, one here. OK, and uh, a set of flashcards or objects. They can be from anything that you've done in the term. Mixed uh, vocabulary sets. The idea is you move them object by object from one box to another. OK, and then after you've moved them all, as many as you like, you can challenge pupils to remember how many objects they saw moving along the conveyor belt. This is really good for pupils who have good memories. OK, it gives them a chance to shine and help their help their classmates as well. So that's just three examples of um, how we can scaffold. Um, let's have a look at the beginning of a unit. And this is from third of primary. OK, it could be third or fourth of primary, but this one is from uh, our new course, which is uh, Steps into English, and it's um, a typical unit beginning. OK, so what we find here is we've got the vocabulary presentation. So going back to our diagnosis and our decoding of, OK, what language problems are they going to have? Well, this is quite straightforward because it's just a vocabulary presentation. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at this lexical set here. And immediately we can see that three of the words are not exactly cognates, but to um, peoples in most regions of Spain, they'll be fairly recognisable. OK, tiger, elephant, zebra. So maybe we need to uh, um, fix our focus, our attention on the other words that are going to be more difficult. How can we do that? Well, one old classic that I'm sure you all know is Kim's Game. Kim's Game is where you put flashcards on a board, objects on a tray, they hide their eyes, you take one away and they have to remember which one's gone. OK, uh, another less common one is Mastermind. OK, and this comes from uh, a game we used to play uh, when I was growing up. I used to have a set um, uh, in the UK. I don't know whether you had it here, but the idea was it was like a board. It had little holes for putting pegs in and uh, you choose to you would choose three different colored blue and green, but your opponent wouldn't see them. They had to guess your three colors and your order, the order you put them in. So this is a game that I sometimes uh, have done in the, in the classroom to help um, sort of hammer some more difficult vocabulary. And it's exactly the same principle, but um, maybe with a set of uh, mini flashcards or just writing the words down. Mini flashcards are great. Uh, they're something that you can actually make uh, in class, get fast finishes to make them, uh, whatever. And um, you can choose three, OK, but your opponent doesn't see them. Now, your opponent has to guess. OK, so I've got parrot, snake and frog. So my opponent might go, uh, let's see, monkey, fish, parrot. Right now, the answers I can give are black, white or nothing. White means they've guessed the correct word and the correct position. Black means um, They've only they've guessed the correct word, but it's not in the correct place. OK, and in the game, we used to do this with little pegs. But 
we can just do it with circles drawn. OK, uh, it's important they keep a record of what they've said and uh, the uh, and, and your reply, because now with that answer black, they know that one of them is correct. OK, so by elimination, eventually they'll find out that parrot's the correct one and they might say parrot, frog, monkey. They get a white because parrot's correct in the correct place. OK, frog is also correct, but not in the correct place. So they get a black. OK, they don't know whether the black is for snake or frog. So they just have to keep going until eventually they get all three correct. Parrot, snake, frog. And the answer is white, white, white. And what's happened here is that we have just hammered the vocabulary continuously so that um, they think they're playing, but we know they're learning. I think I've heard that somewhere before. So that's a great activity for um, helping pupils with some more difficult vocabulary, getting them to say it over and over again in the context of a game. Another activity to scaffold spelling for pupils that have difficulty is the old drawing on your partner's back, drawing the letters. You feel them, uh, the, you, you feel your partner drawing, you have to uh, feel what the letters are and guess the word. Another um, good, uh, it's not really an activity, but for fast fit, for, for not fast finishers, for learners who um, are kind of getting the hang of the vocabulary, they're stronger learners, you can make them pronunciation police. Their task, their challenge is to listen for the pronunciation of the key vocabulary, make sure that people are saying zebra and not febra, okay, and basically police the pronunciation. And this is a rule you can swap round, okay. Um, so that's another way of, uh, of giving maybe more able pupils um, more of a challenge. OK, so imagine we've done in the unit, we've done the vocabulary presentation. Um, the next thing is where the vocabulary is contextualised uh, and the students, uh, the pupils produce it, uh, usually in the form of a song. OK, here's the song. Uh, songs are great for actions. Actions help to consolidate meaning. Lots of opportunities for actions in this song. As you can see, there's a picture of me in my garden being a tree. OK, the idea is that uh, uh, pupils would take it in turns to be the tree and in a really sort of interactive, kinesthetic way, other pupils in the class would take turns. And according to the verse in the song, it's the first one, it's behind the tree. They would place the flashcard behind the tree or in it or on it, etc. And when you get the handout, you'll see ideas for other kind of language points where you can actually do this and bring this to life and help consolidate meaning. Then you've got the grammar. OK, what problems in this unit could they have here? Well, the most likely thing really is the prepositions, no, because that's the, uh, the language focus. So how can we scaffold these? Well, one thing we should always um, take care to do is link the learning. OK, link back to the song. The language here is repeated from the song. Maybe get them to chant a little bit. OK, or fix on the actual main target language, the prepositions. One way you can do this is divide them up into groups. Whole class activity, but uh, into groups. The in-group, the on-group, the behind group, the under group. OK, so here simply you get a box. You take an object or a flashcard, put it, for example, in the box and the uh, in group will shout in. OK, and this is a good example of uh, an activity where we can build in some multiple task fulfillment so that it's not just a, a black or white scenario. There's, a, there's only one form of task completion. No, let's tailor our task completion to our different levels. So the baseline level is simply to say in, OK, or they can say in the box or the more able pupils might want to say it's in the box. You can encourage them to do that. And the great advantage of this is that as well as have as everybody can uh, can basically fulfill the task and get the important thing, which is the preposition, uh, you can expose some of the weaker pupils to the modelling of the stronger pupils, OK? So eventually that will rub off on them and they'll be making complete sentences as well. 
Okay, so we've established our baseline. Okay, they should now be in a position where they can carry out the activity, but some pupils may need more time than others. Okay, so it's important to have an extension in mind. This is a question answer activity. So some of the fast finishers can turn it into an answer question. I'll say the answer, you guess the question. You can either look at your book and find the question, or you can do it from memory, which is a bit more challenging. Or another good uh, um, thing to do with fast finishers is to recycle some other language. So you're bringing in some language they'll already be familiar with. In this, in this uh, example, um, one pupil thinks of it's behind the tree, for example, and the other one has to guess, is it in the tree? No, it isn't. Is it behind the tree? Yes, it is. So they're recycling other language. OK, and um, two things we need to consider when teaching grammar are mechanics, the mechanics of the sentence, how it's built up and the meaning. And this is exactly what we've done by scaffolding and extending the activity. Right, it's your turn. OK, um, I've, got, I've um, written a statement here which is, there is no such thing as a difficult text for reading. There is only a difficult task. Now, if you disagree, my aim is to convince you otherwise. Right, how many of you speak Hungarian? Anybody? If you do, then you're going to find this extremely easy, but I'm assuming that not too many people speak Hungarian. I certainly don't, okay? But I did learn a bit from this activity. Okay, now, what I'd like you to do is um, I'm going to show you a website and have your say. I'd like you to answer a question. I'm going to give you a couple of warmer questions first. Let's enlarge this so that you can see it better. And you don't have to answer this question. You can say it out loud to anybody who's in your house and annoy them. Um, and the answer to th the, the, the question I'd like you to think about first is, what is the website about? OK, don't type anything. That's just a warm up question. What is it about? Well, Louise, what, what do you reckon? What, what, what's it about this website? Um, it looks to me it's relate, that it's related to tourism or something. No, maybe it's. Um, How do you know that? Because you don't speak Hungarian. Yeah, but I, there's lots of images there. Ah, of course, there's lots of images. Screaming. That's true. Yeah, it looked like so a So I'm going to ask you a more on. challenging question, Louise. Right? Okay. Okay. Um, you can see in this, uh, there's a piece of blue text and a piece of red text in the sort of centre right of the screen. Now, there are two seasons in there in Hungarian. One of them says Teli and the other says Niari. Okay? I, okay. I hope I've said them more or less okay. What yeah, seasons yeah, do you think they are? Well, what do you I think, think is um, Delhi, the blue? I think it's winter. And you'd be right. So what do you think is Niari? Um, uh, well, summer, perhaps. It's summer. Sure. How did you know? Well, I suppose it's the con maybe it's the colours, maybe it's the... Um, mm, also, yeah, these are the two main sea i mean there are key seasons for tourism so i immediately exactly. my brain exactly. Exactly. Immediately right. went there. you've used yeah. the visual clue of the colors and you've used also your knowledge of, of tourism and you've uh, you've drawn on that okay and so you've managed to yeah. answer two questions about that well. just by using your intuition logic your knowledge of the world whatever and i'm going to give everybody a question now and that question is, if you go to um, your uh, have you say, is it the, um, Louise will tell you exactly what to yeah. uh, what to click. But you have to answer the question. How do you say please select in Hungarian? Don't worry about accents. If you misspell it, it doesn't matter. But just write um, as quickly as you can how you say please select in Hungarian. Yes. And as Dave said, this is just um, this is it will appear on your screen now in a window. Um, just write very short. How do you say please select in in Hungarian? And I think people are yes, people are answering, Dave. I'm just going through. Um, 
Okay. I won't say it yet. Somebody has written an answer and I don't want to um, say it quite yet. Okay. Let's see. I think some people are having a job seeing it because it's quite small, but some people are getting yeah. it right. Yes, some people are getting it right. Shall yeah, we say? Shall I give an answer? Word or, yeah. or words. Well, there is there is an answer here. Shall I say it, Dave? Yes, please. Um, I'm not. I'm probably not pronouncing <laughs> it very well. Kerem Balas. 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 Exactly. Is that correct? Wow. Okay. Well, well done to the person. That who is the answer. That yes. Answer. Okay. I'll, yes. I'll make it a bit bigger so that you can see it. It's Kerem Valachon. Again, I, I, I hope I got the pronunciation right. I did check it with Google. Uh, how did you know? Well, you obviously knew because you knew whereabouts on a website it would say, please select. I could have asked you probably as well, how do you say search in Hungarian? You'd have got that right. Okay. So hopefully, I've uh, I've I've proved my point to a, um, to a point, okay, that it's really the task and not the text, okay. Um, so let's uh, have a look and put that into practice. Here's a text again from the same unit from Macmillan Steps into English, okay. It's the same unit as before. We saw the grammar. This is the reading. Let's have a look at our question because we want to establish a baseline um, activity. How many animals hide in grass? Well, uh, if we enlarge the parts where this information appears, we could probably say that a Hungarian who didn't know English could do this activity okay. It's fairly mechanical because all they've got to do is match the language, okay? So I think we can safely say this is our baseline. So what we need to do is extend this, okay, for fast finishers. One thing is we can get them to create a table and categorize the information in the text. For example, the animal, uh, the size, the color, what it can do. And again, we can make uh, this multiple task fulfillment. We can um, ask some pupils to, we can give them the categories. Okay, but if there's other pupils we feel could deal with a challenge, we can get them to deduce the categories. Okay, to get them to invent it. Another thing is vocabulary collection. Get fast finishers to collect vocabulary so that when the others finish, you pair a fast finisher with a slower finisher and they test each other on the vocabulary using the list that the fast finisher has created. It's multiple task fulfillment because uh, you can do this in a variety of ways. A correct answer is simply a translation or you can challenge them to uh, put this into a sentence, okay? The sentence from the original text. So got, what you've got here is pupils working towards their ability, and then you've got the um, more able pupil modeling the language for the pupils having more difficulty. So eventually they'll be able to pick up on that modeling and, uh, uh, and, and, and take that lead and probably be able to, to imitate what the uh, what the other pupils saying okay so it's a kind of a way of one pupil teaching the other without it really appearing that they're teaching okay um so uh, moving on to another type of activity speaking okay and this is a great activity for any dialogue mini dialogue question answer exchange the core activity is the dialogue once they've practiced that in pairs, you can put them into a group of four and you can convert this from being a boring course book activity to being on a film set. OK, um, you've got a director and you've got a reviewer. And this means bringing in more language. Obviously, you would have to input and scaffold this language the first time you use it. But once you've done it a few times, you'll find that it becomes quite second nature. You can have the director saying, you ask the questions, you answer the questions, you stand here. Here are your props. OK, and you can have the reviewer giving a reaction. That was great. That was excellent. That was fantastic. OK, um, to get them to really listen, give them a task. They have to judge the pronunciation and give them a score. Pronunciation, nine points, etc. OK, 
So now you've basically got two stronger pupils modeling all of this language for the possibly weaker pupils. I don't like using those terms, but just really as a shorthand so that we, uh, we realize we're talking about pupils that can do it easily and uh, ones that may need a bit more practice. And after you've done this a couple of times, you've got the stronger pupils to model the language and you can swap roles. OK, uh, so it's a good way of cooperative uh, cooperative learning. OK, where so that you can get this, the, uh, the stronger pupils to model for the for the uh, for the weaker pupils. OK, uh, or if you don't want to, to swap tasks, everybody is doing something that they can comfortably fulfill. Right. So what kinds of thinking skills will our pupils have practiced so far at these levels, which are really first to fourth of primary? Well, lower order thinking skills such as recognizing, memorizing, listing, understanding. OK, um, these are sort of base level skills that are appropriate for these age groups that we can use then to build on as they get a little bit older. And what I'd like you to do while I look at the last two skills, OK, listening and writing uh, at uh, fifth of primary level. OK, I'd like you to think on what skills they're using here to build on these. So let's go to a listening, OK? Now, um, the best way of scaffolding a listening is to uh, bridge the gap. Bridging the gap means bringing the student, the pupils closer to the listening to make it easier for them when they come to listen, because listening is a very difficult skill. How can we do this? Well, we can do our Hungarian diagnosis, or we can elicit the vocabulary, the target vocabulary from them. OK, this is called problems in my environment. So what I've done here is I've taken screenshots of the problem areas. OK, if I don't uh, have uh, an interactive whiteboard, I can simply get them to cover this up in their book and I can elicit where are these problem areas. OK, rivers, trees, the streets. OK, and uh, these are the, the categories that they're going to hear about in the listening. Now I can take each one of these, OK, and uh, they can create a mind map and I can model the first one for them. Now I know because I'm the teacher and I've looked at this beforehand that the target language is adjectives. Adjectives to do with places in a city, OK, uh, some related to uh, pollution. So I can ask them and I, I, can, I can do this on the board first, take rivers and build up a mind map and say, what's the problem with these rivers? And they can say they are polluted or they might say they are contaminados, in which case I can sandwich and say, yes, they're polluted, contaminados, polluted. OK, and I write polluted on the board. I do the same with dirty. We elicit that. I also know that in the post listening, they're going to be pairing adjectives with their opposite. So that's something I can elicit from them at this stage as well. We know the river's dirty and polluted, but how would we like the river? We'd like it to be clean and clear. OK, so by the time they come to listen, OK, they've got a massive advantage because they've already produced the target language themselves. Moving on, as we have to really quickly, because uh, we haven't got much time, um, the, a writing task, OK? Typical writing task. Um, first thing, what do I need to do to diagnose the, uh, the language that, uh, that, that we need to kind of work on and support? Let's have a look. OK, here it's there is, there are, there isn't, there aren't. Great activity for doing this is tennis, writing tennis, OK? Right, groups of four. Within your group of four, pair A and pair B. Pair A and pair B each get a piece of paper. And then I dictate a word to all of the pair A's, which is hotel, and I dictate a word to all of the pair B's, which is lots, because I'm thinking of my sentence with there is and there are, the language they're going to need to produce. OK, the focus. Now, what I ask them to do is write a word before or after this word. OK. Now, swap your papers. Read what you have in front of you, what the other group has written, and add a word before or after. Swap back again. 
add another word before or after. And this activity can have two conclusions. It can either be the first group to com complete a sentence is the winner, or more challenging, the first group to complete the sentence is the loser. The advantage of this is that it challenges them to think about how they can keep building the sentence to avoid completing it and make their opponents complete it. And so as soon as they receive a sentence, so um, that is a complete sentence, okay, on their paper from the other group, they go, that's a sentence, and they win the point, okay? Finally, one last activity, concentric circles. Okay, you can do this about any text because they tend to be structured in a very similar way. Draw a series of concentric circles on the board. Rome was the title of the uh, text. Okay, and um, then I can either elicit what's in the rest of the text by saying in the second circle, we're moving out. Okay, what's the essential information about Rome? What is it? Where is it? Well, it's a capital city. It's in Italy. Okay, what's it like? Next circle. It's old and it's busy. OK, in Rome, what is there? What are there? Well, there are ruins, there are hotels, restaurants, etc. Then what can you do? So what we're doing is we're making a visual representation of the text. This is a great way of mapping out the text. OK, um, what I could actually do is then um, draw with elicited words, get them afterwards to fill in the words from the text. OK, into these categories. And then when they come to uh, use this as a model to write their own text about their own city, they've got everything they need, the language all mapped out in the concentric circles. The other advantage of this is, again, it's a multiple task fulfillment strategy. OK, so when they come to write their task, the baseline can be you need to include information from the first three circles. OK, if you uh, if you can try the first four circles. And if you're really feeling good, try something from all five circles. OK, so you're giving all pupils a chance to fulfill the task. And yet you're giving the um, pupils who can cope with the challenge something extra. OK, so it's a great way of mapping out a, ta uh, um, a text for writing. So back to the question of what kinds of thinking skills will our pupils have practiced at this level? And this is the last interactive um, task. And I'd like you to just think of one skill from the listening or the writing activity that pupils have practiced, okay? And, uh, and write it, please, okay? Okay, so yeah, we'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Uh, write a short answer, one task from the reading and writing, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Let's see what people are saying. I think there's actually a variety, Dave, of, of, of um, skills being being developed here it's um, which ones have we got what we got we are they're coming in now um uh, let me see uh okay thinking skills oh yeah um, here we go inferring. Inferring, connecting making connections between things yeah. associations and that's a key that's really key in language learning isn't yeah, it Bringing absolutely together definitely um uh, um absolutely again connecting uh, completing yeah. text as a model. Um, okay. There's also, I would add, analyzing as well. Definitely, yeah. Um, and so all yeah. of these suggestions, basically, we can see we're moving up the pyramid or the taxonomy. If we are. Like. I'll just show you Absolutely. four that I, I wrote down, classifying, discriminating, applying, deducing. But all of the ones that have come up here are equally valid. And so basically, we're um, giving pupils a chance to practice different skills, okay? Often some pupils yeah. find some skills um, more easy than others, okay? But it's very important that we give, that we design our tasks to uh, build on basic skills to get them to do gradually more challenging things. I've nearly finished, well, in fact, I have finished. 
Uh, or I just want to point out a few more things that I think are really important considerations when teaching mixed ability. One thing is self-assessment, okay? Giving pupils a chance to take ownership of their own learning. And you can do this really simply by can-do phrases. Allow them to measure their own progress, okay? For example, set them the same writing at the beginning of every term or at the end of every term, okay? Then they can see how much they've improved and you can see whether the feedback that you've given has, uh, has helped them, okay? And whether um, they, they, they have progressed. Also, you remember formative assessment, okay? It's the forgotten sibling of summative assessment. Summative assessment is the big bully that tends to eclipse uh, formative assessment because teachers have to put a number for the parents to put on the report okay but we should also remember that assessment gives us a chance to find out where the problem areas are where do we need to scaffold where do our pupils need more help how can we um, fine-tune our teaching how can we adapt it um, to be able to uh, solve these kind of problems okay so it's worth bearing in mind informal peer teaching um, uh, we can even we, we, we've seen lots of examples of that, uh, bearing in mind uh, the old uh, Vygotsky's zone of uh, proximal development, which basically says that children learn from a more knowledgeable either other child or adult. OK, and often this has much more impact if they're learning from a peer than learning from a teacher. So build the kind of opportunities into activities that we've looked at in this session. And finally, I would say the most important of all, OK, is the big motivator, which is praise. Don't just praise task fulfillment, praise efforts. If they've made an effort, then give them some praise and your words will mean the world to them. A great quote here. Children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression, and it's always worth bearing that in mind, okay? Um, if anybody has a question, just for the last couple of minutes, it would be, uh, be great to, uh, to hear your questions, and we'll try and answer them if we can. Um, yeah. So please do uh, send your questions, and uh, I'd just like to say, I'd like to reiterate what Louise said about... Uh, well done, everybody, for uh, for keeping education going in these difficult times. And many thanks for watching and listening to me for this uh, for this um, this talk. That's great. Thank you very much, Dave. Yes, we'll just wait now um, a couple of seconds to see if um, some questions and comments come in. Um, Dave, you've offered a lot of um, great ideas, and I think your 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 really um, key point about um, trying to reach all abilities has come through crystal clear and you've you've offered so many ideas for doing that at all the different levels from primary one up to primary six and even within these levels the the activities are uh, can be adapted you no know, from level to level um, I think that's a very important point that you've just made. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've illustrated them uh, tied to certain levels, but uh, you can adapt them all to uh, to whichever level that you're teaching. Exactly. Yeah. So people are saying thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. I just want to say well, great ideas. To yes. Um, I'll just check, see if there are any questions. One second. I'm going down the list. Oh, could you repeat your final sentence about children are like cement? The person really oh, likes yes, the comment. Yes. Maybe okay, like I will. Go back, uh, I'll go pull back. that back on. Uh, let me just find that slide. Um, it, it was by um, Heim Ginot, who was a child psychologist and uh, educational theorist and a teacher as well. He said, children oh. are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. An impression. Absolutely. And so it's very important what falls on them and, and yeah. what we do in the class. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dave. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you for sharing all these great practical ideas for, for, the, for our classes.